This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Let me tell you how this podcast works. There's no great staff that picks the latest and greatest whoever to come on this show. I pick people that I like. I pick people that have something interesting to say that resonates with me. Someone who has deep dived over the course of their life into a topic. And when I hear their insights, I just go, damn, that's cool. That's awesome. Those are the kinds of people that I want. And often the way that I find them, entirely random. My guest today is Timur Karan. He's a professor of economics and political science at Duke University. What caught my eye about his work? A little piece of jargon that he pulled together called preference falsification. Outlined in his book, Private Truths, Public Lies. Essentially, we just don't tell the truth. We tell people one thing when we really believe something else. There's a lot of reasons for this. If there's too much preference falsification, it can dampen a community, a population's capacity to want change because it brings about this intellectual narrowness. People essentially forget. They become stupid. They spend so much time not saying what they really believe that eventually they come to believe the nonsense they say. And they actually forget what they knew. Now that's a shorthand view from my perspective, a little bit of paraphrasing there. But to bring you into the idea of where I want to go today with my guest on preference falsification. And for anyone who has followed American politics in the last couple years, Can you recall the most recent presidential election? We can't believe the polls are wrong. Timor's book was written in 1995. The idea of preference falsification is not new. Us human beings have been doing it for a long time. Again, I'm terribly lucky on this podcast to bring on a diversity of guests to make us all go into thinking actually think, to think about what's going on, not just to listen to some talking head that's reciting some word salad I don't really care for word salad If I ever, ever, ever stop giving it real on this show, please come and kneecap the hell out of me and take me out. Without further delay, let's jump right into my guest, the good professor from Duke University. So listen, I caught this poll today, a Gallup poll, and it was Pomona College. 90% of the students said they don't feel like they can speak freely, right? And the makeup of the students was 50% liberal, 25% very liberal. This was self-described. 50% liberal, 25% very liberal, and 3% conservative. But the key number, the takeaway, is this Gallup poll 90% of the students don't feel like they can speak freely. I think I'm talking to the right guy tonight about that very issue, aren't I? I think so. I've thought a lot about contexts where people don't feel free to speak their minds. And you've defined this in a certain way. And I'm going to let you put your best professorial hat on It's kind of an interesting term that's not necessarily intuitive. It is once you understand what it is, it's intuitive. But when people hear the term preference falsification right out of the gate, they kind of feel like, oh my gosh, what am I in the physics class or something? But it's a really well thought out premise. Why don't you explain that? Preference falsification is a form of lying, but not all lying is preference falsification. Preference falsification is the act of misrepresenting one's wants because of perceived social pressures. And it aims specifically 
to manipulate the perception of others about one's motivations or dispositions. In the context of the Pomona case, in that case, several forms of preference falsification is undoubtedly taking place, and the Pomona students are reporting that they are, in fact, routinely engaged in some forms of preference falsification. Intellectual preference falsification, for example, they may feel uncomfortable challenging particular arguments put before them by professors or presented in classrooms because of a fear that they might be accused of racism or or some kind of uh, bias or sexism of some sort. So they will stay quiet. They will pretend to understand and approve and accept the theories that are presented to them when, in fact, they have uh, many doubts. There's also on many campuses, I imagine that Pomona is no uh, different, there's social uh, preference falsification. People feel that there are certain issues that they cannot touch and that if they do touch them, they have to take a particular point of view completely uncritically without even acknowledging that perhaps there is another side, there is another perspective, there are other considerations one should take into account. All such suppression, whether it's in the social sphere or in the the classroom, constitutes examples of preference falsification. Let's keep it in the academic circle for a moment. If we are pondering colleges and universities across the world, if we're really at this point where students feel this inability for, as you just outlined, many different reasons to say how they feel, to say how they think, to counteract or to give an alternate take than perhaps either the professor or their other peers, isn't that just like a terribly big failure for all of us when it comes to the university system? It is, in fact, a huge failure. It's particularly alarming because this is happening in a society that considers itself one of the freest on earth. And it's happening in a society where our constitution guarantees freedom of thought and freedom of of expression. But despite that, And universities, and to add to that, I should say, universities claim that they are places where all ideas can be debated. They ostensibly are training students to become critical uh, thinkers. If in a premier college in the United States, within the American academic system, 90% of students feel they can't speak freely, that they cannot engage with other students, with professors uh, freely, they can't say what's on their mind honestly and openly, we've got a huge problem. I went and looked before we talked today a little bit more at that Gallup poll And there was some other data in there. And one of the other pieces of information that came out of it is that same student body at Pomona that was polled, 50% of them were very comfortable and wanted their First Amendment rights. The other 50% thought there should be limits on speech, which is an interesting conundrum there. So you have 90%, almost all of them saying, I don't feel comfortable to say certain things. And then half of them are saying, But hold on, we want to be regulated. Well, what they're saying is if you go, I haven't seen this this Gallup poll, but I've seen similar studies. And of course, I teach at a university, at Duke University, and talk to students all the time. Sometimes I get quite 
close to some students because I've had them in a number of classes. And at the end of it, they open up to me a little bit more than they would perhaps to normally because they know I take such an interest in free speech. They share with me their own experiences. These students are not asking for their own views to be regulated. They get upset when they cannot say what's on their mind. The 50% that you referred to would like other students' views to be regulated. So they think that there are students on campus who have views that are beyond the pale, that are views that normal human beings should not hold and that those views have no place in polite civil discourse. They don't even need to be uh, considered. These, this 50% is willing to censor those students. They would get very upset and they would invoke the First Amendment if an attempt were made to shut them down. Of course, the, the irony there jumps out at you, but apparently not for students between the ages of 18 and 22. And I don't think it's limited to students between 18 and 22, but an alarming trend is that the percentage of people who don't see the irony there, who have these double standards, is alarmingly high among the millennials. Let me move into a slightly controversial area. But before I do, I want to kind of lay this predicate down. As far as I can tell, when I'm looking at preference falsification, there doesn't seem to be some ideology that does it more than another. It doesn't seem like to me, if I say, okay, somebody on the left or someone on the right or, you know, a communist country or socialist country, it doesn't seem like there's uh, something that says this one particular group should do this more than another. Everyone's doing it. Is that a fair assessment? I would agree with that, but let me add to it an anecdote that goes back three decades to when I started working on preference falsification. My very first paper on preference falsification where I developed the idea was one that defined various terms, developed the theory, talked about how preference falsification leads to inefficiencies, and then as an example gave Eastern Europe, which at the time was under Soviet occupation, was living in in the communism. So I presented this paper, and this was at a a seminar at, at UCLA, and at the end of the talk, which was quite well received, Someone, a very, very distinguished economist, put up his uh, his hand and he said, you know, I, I find this all very fascinating, but why didn't you call your paper a theory of communist dictatorship? As far as I can tell, he said, this has nothing to do with the United States because here's the most interesting thing, because he said in the United States, we have a constitution that protects free speech. My answer to him was, I said, it does apply to the United States because the fact that we have legal protections for speech doesn't mean that as individuals living in in a society with free speech guarantees, we will exercise that freedom. And that's the critical point right there is just because you have the freedom doesn't mean you're going to use it. Doesn't mean you're going to use it. Every one of these students at Pomona, all 100% of them, have the freedom under the law to say what they want. And if you look at Pomona's student handbook and faculty handbook, I'm sure sure it looks like the ones we have at other universities, it says you are free to express your views. The limits are that you cannot deliberately insult somebody, you cannot use fighting words, but if you believe that a certain policy is inefficient, if you believe that a certain postmodernist theory 
that your literature professor is putting forward is absurd, that it's nothing but rubbish, and you think that it's illogical, you are free in the classroom, according to the Pomona Student Handbook, you are free to express your view. And in fact, Pomona formally encourages you to do that on the ground that it's good for others. It's, it's, it's good for you to think critically, but it also makes other students in the classroom think it's good for the educational process. But the fact that we have these principles and these rights doesn't make students exercise those rights and live by those uh, principles. And that is what this Gallup poll that you cited is uh, showing. We have a, a huge, huge disconnect between the rights that we enjoy and the principles by which we're supposed to live and the way we're actually living. So let me dive into an example as I laid that political foundation at the beginning that this is something that I think we can find an example of preference falsification across the spectrum. But I think we do have a very topical example in the United States of America with the president of the United States. And I'm going to pick a particular area to go, and I would love for you to comment on this. But one of the most interesting things about the 2016 election was the constant talking about polls, right? So you have everyone talking about polls, in particular, I can think of two people that were not happy, understandably, with Trump's winning, and that would be Hillary Clinton and Jim Comey. So Hillary Clinton, who lost to Trump, Jim Comey, who was fired by Trump from the FBI. And both Hillary Clinton and, and Comey, and look, I, I get it. If people want to throw slings and arrows at me for this, that's fine. But this is a very concrete example that if we can all just say, let's just put our partisan polls aside for a second. Both Comey and both Clinton kept talking about the polls. Even today, they keep talking about the polls. Now, people listening to our conversation, Timor, they might be saying, hey, Mike and Timor, they're having this academic conversation. It's not really important. Hold on. We have, you know, the, the director of the FBI talking about polls. But here, you're kind of saying, hey, hold on. What does a poll tell us? Like, I mean, when someone wraps their arms around the idea of preference falsification, how is it that you ever really believe a poll again? Once you understand the concept of preference falsification, and once you understand that it can be very prevalent, even in places where people are free under the law to say whatever they want, people do not necessarily tell the truth to posters. Understanding the concept of preference falsification and its implications sensitizes you to how polls are conducted. A poll conducted or the phone is not the same as a poll conducted online. A poll that gives you anonymity, strict anonymity, is quite different from one that exposes your identity at the very least to the pollster and possibly to many, uh, many others. There's a huge difference in this. This is why we can find in elections two polls conducted in the same area that give us very different, uh, different results. One of the reasons has to do with the way the poll was conducted, the degree of anonymity it gave to the respondents. Another is that pollsters are aware of the fact that the people they're polling will not necessarily tell them the truth. So they make adjustments to their sample. But those adjustments are all based on assumptions about what they think the sensitive issues are and what types of views are being hidden. But it's all, if they're not conducting polls properly, there's a lot of guesswork involved there. And they make huge mistakes in setting up their samples, excluding certain groups or oversampling certain groups on the grounds that those particular groups are not as vocal as as others. And that is why our polls 
can differ so much. In the latest presidential election, it turned out that Donald Trump's pollsters had a more realistic sense of what the American people were thinking than Hillary Clinton's pollsters did. And they will tell you this now. In the days running up to the election, Hillary Clinton was confident that she had a blue, I forget what it was called, this blue wall that was going to win her the election. She didn't have to campaign in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, places like that, because those were all uh, wrapped up. Well, Donald Trump's pollsters were actually seeing something uh, something different. What do you know about that difference? That's interesting. Seemingly the same populations of people and pollsters want to try to get an accurate handle of what's going on. How did they have such differing results? Specifically, they had quite different views of how working class Democrats in these states were going to vote. The Democrats felt that for economic reasons, these voters were going to by and large vote Democratic, that they would not vote for a Republican candidate who was likely to pursue policies that would continue to shrink the economic base in their communities, the Republican pollsters were noticing that these voters were concerned also about social issues and about identity issues, and that these were just as important or perhaps more important than the economic concerns that the Democratic pollsters were focusing on. What the Trump voters sensed was was that there were social grievances there, that many of these voters in these blue states, these blue collar voters in these uh, blue states felt that their own grievances were not taken seriously by the Democratic Party on the grounds that they were white. They felt that they could not express this. They could not openly say what they thought, which is that there are various identity groups in the Democratic Party, which leave us out, and we are unable to say this. There are all sorts of programs for other groups. The Democratic Party is formally committed to improving the economic prospects of African Americans, of immigrants, of uh, Hispanics, of women, but were left out, and in fact, we are considered the victimizers of all these groups, implicitly in most conversations, occasionally explicitly. And we are unable in the Democratic Party to articulate this. Donald Trump articulated those grievances, and what the Republican pollsters recognized is that these grievances ran deep enough that they just might trump, so to speak, the economic grievances that these voters did believe and probably still believe the Democratic Party is likely to address better than Republicans. Let me read something from you really quick. This is a quote of yours. It says, once a minimum threshold of people holding certain private preferences is met, Even a minor event can lead to a dramatic change in economic, social, and political institutions. Now, what's interesting about that is once a minimum threshold of people holding certain private preferences is met, even a minor event, I might argue that the minor event, which was really a major event, was Trump himself. Trump himself was the event that gave the people that you just described the opportunity to kind of see these private preferences they have manifested in a candidate. Absolutely. And I should just add to that quote you cited that achieving a minimum 
threshold of a particular kind of private preference, a threshold of number of dissenters, let, let us say, may lead to an explosion, may lead to a dramatic change in public opinion. It will not necessarily do that because the very the fact that you know that there are a lot of people who think like you, that there are a lot of other dissenters, does not guarantee that you will make a move. That tipping point, you can't necessarily predict it, right? The tipping point's interesting. You can't predict it, and you can't predict it because as an individual, even if I know that I am in the majority, that the majority of all the voters, majority of the people in my community are dissenters, they think like me, I will not necessarily make a move until I know that others are going to do the same. If I stick my neck out, the 30% who don't agree with us will jump on me, and many of the people who think like me may jump on me also, may participate in ostracizing me, precisely to prove that they are part of the status quo, that they are not dissenters. Come back to Trump now. Now, what did Trump do? Trump sensed that there is a quite large group of people who are disaffected. And he had to prove to them that he was willing to take on many sacred cows, that he was willing to take on the establishment, that he wasn't afraid of anything. And it is precisely for that reason that he went on very systematically insulting groups of people, either individuals or groups of people that are very widely admired in the United States. I'll give you one example here, which will make, which I think is a powerful uh, one. Early on, he insulted John McCain. You might remember that John McCain supposed ostensible mistake was to have been caught by the Vietnamese. Trump said something like, I'm not, I'm sure I'm not getting the words exactly right, but he said that he had greater admiration for soldiers who didn't get caught than, than for ones that did get caught. In bad taste. In, in bad taste. And he picked somebody, John McCain, who was admired by Republicans and Democrats alike and yes, people will disagree with particular positions that John McCain has taken, but the vast majority agree that he is an American hero. Through that statement, Trump not only insulted an American hero, but he also insulted millions of veterans who play a very important role in Republican politics. Interestingly, the day after he made that comment, his popularity within the Republican Party rose and his chances of winning the nomination also uh, went up, not just in polls, but also in betting markets. Now, what is the, how can we explain how a, a candidate can improve his prospects of winning an election by insulting a hero to practically all Americans and insulting a group that a Republican candidate typically has to win big to win the nomination. What he was signaling there is that he was willing to take on practically anybody who was part of the establishment. And John McCain is a member of the establishment. Donald Trump was signaling that he could take on these people. He wasn't afraid of doing it. So he wasn't afraid of saying something even in, in bad taste that would insult somebody like John McCain. What many people in the United States, many people who felt they could not speak honestly heard is that there is finally a candidate who 
is willing to take a lot of arrows from all sides to make a point. He's not afraid of taking on the establishment. And that is something, and then if you then look at the, the rest of the campaign, he challenged various groups uh, that in fact many Americans dislike or uh, distrust, including the mass media. But when he attacked them, his popularity again rose because they felt that uh, he had the courage to challenge the media that in the minds of these disaffected voters focused on the grievances of other segments of society and ignored deliberately and persistently ignored their own grievances and to add insult to injury made them look like the victimizers of other groups. They felt that Trump would finally take on these these groups and put them in their place. Let me add another line from you, which I think will give the audience context here. Public discourse can be categorized between the thinkable and the unthinkable and the thought and the unthought. Now, whether somebody likes Trump or despises Trump, to look at him, he clearly got this. Whether or not he ever read any of your work and, and dove in, Trump clearly instinctively gets the notion of the thinkable and the unthinkable, the thought and the unthought. He gets that on a base level, doesn't he? Yes, absolutely. He gets it on a very base level, and he realizes that there are unthinkable thoughts, and that by articulating those, he was going to be reaching millions of people because the politicians, whether whether Republican politicians or Democratic politicians, there were certain thoughts that politicians would not articulate. He would do that. And he gave hope to millions of individuals that he would continue to do this if he became president. It's a fascinating example. We can go down the rabbit hole with Trump all day. I would like, though, to expand this out because your work is far beyond Trump. Some people are so triggered by Trump that if we don't expand it out, they'll miss the larger point, perhaps. And we should point out here that the book was written and it was published in 1995, so it was long before Trump. Yes, and I should give the name right now since you mentioned it. Private Truths, Public Lies, The Social Consequences of Preference Falsification. Let me jump into another example. I know it's one that you have uh, written about, you've talked about, which is Tahir Square in Cairo, circa 2011, the Arab Spring, everything unfolding. Why don't you lay some of that out from the preference falsification standpoint and remind people how much was bottled up inside Egypt ready to explode? Egypt has long been a very poorly governed society. It's very poor. It has been governed for decades, most of the 20th century, by a series of corrupt dictators who also were quite repressive and became increasingly repressive in the 1990s and as we entered the 21st century. Because the society was so repressive, people could not openly oppose the regime. Their dictator, Hosni Mubarak, ran essentially unopposed in election after election. He had been in, in power for 30 years. And anyone who dared uh, challenge his policies or campaign for democracy was harassed, ostracized, often jailed and tortured in, in jail. You had millions of people 
especially among the young. I should point out that the rate of unemployment was extremely high and youth unemployment was around 40 percent. Unemployment was high even among people with college uh, degrees. So he had a great deal of discontent. It seemed to the rest of the world that things would just go on in Egypt like that indefinitely because the centers had no way to get organized the moment three or four people got together to form an organization to do something about the situation. The secret police would uh, identify them and cart them off to uh, the jail. Well, against this background, some people started getting organized on social media. Some of them were living outside of Egypt, some of them were in Egypt, but they were using code words. And as it turns out, the Egyptian Secret Service was not quite up to task in tracking the in the keeping track of social media and connecting the organizers who had code names online with real people. Well, these people got got organized and one of the biggest challenges when you have a large number of uh, dissenters, but they're all afraid to act individually, one of the biggest challenges is to get them to uh, coordinate and act at once. And this is what they accomplished by agreeing to show up in Tahrir Square, Cairo's largest square, all at the same time. Once they accomplished this, once once they got there, they suddenly felt that they had power in their, their hands because they felt that there were so many of them, hundreds of thousands of them in the square. They felt that the uh, regime would be reluctant to start shooting on, on these uh, demonstrators, leading possibly to thousands, tens of thousands of uh, deaths. They sense as time went on, they felt that the regime, in fact, found itself in a bind. These demonstrators refused to leave uh, the square. They noticed as time went on that the regime was divided, that, that uh, some of the soldiers were befriending the, the demonstrators. They felt that the regime was really, the regime felt trapped, that the regime had to make a major compromise, which in fact it did by sacrificing Hosni Mubarak, uh, the leader. So the leader, the, the, the major demand of the demonstrators was that the leader go, the leader, the military regime, in fact, let Hosni Mubarak go. He became the scapegoat. He was put behind bars, at least temporarily. The, the situation was uh, diffused. The regime called for elections. What the regime tried to do then was to get people to leave the square. And in fact, once they left the square, the demonstrators lost the initiative, the demonstrators were, did not form an organized political party. These remember during the years of repression, the centers were allowed to organize. So these millions of demonstrators who had come to Tahrir Square because of shared grievances all went back to their homes and they were disorganized. The only organized power in society was the Muslim Brotherhood. Not a good choice. Not a good choice. Not the choice of the people who demonstrated. And in fact, the Muslim Brotherhood did not itself participate in the demonstrations. It just waited on the sidelines until the very end, hoping to pick up the pieces. And the reason it felt it could do that is because it was the only organized alternative to the regime. And it was the only organized alternative because the one place that the regime was afraid to touch and the regime was unable to control completely was the mosque. 
and the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, organized through the uh, the mosque. So the Muslim Brotherhood. I'll be very brief here. The Muslim Brotherhood came to uh, came to power. Then there was a power struggle between the regime and the and the Muslim Brotherhood, which the regime won within a year, year and a half. And now we we're, we're back to the previous situation. Mubarak is gone. We have another uh, dictator, Sisi. The only difference being that Sisi is even more repressive. He's He has learned from uh, Mubarak. And like China, like many other, like Russia, like many other repressive countries, he is very tightly controlling social media because the regime learned through hard ex- experience that social media can be used to coordinate a demonstration. That is the background for the Egyptian uprising. Let me give a, a shift from Egypt to you name the country. I've actually got one in mind, and I'll throw it out in a second. But here's where I want to shift. What's interesting about the Egyptian situation that you just outlined is that there was a certain amount of private knowledge still in the body politics, or the people still had this private knowledge that, hey, we know the right way. You know, if we get the opportunity, we know the right way still. However, when you're dealing with the thinkable, right, and if it moves into the unthinkable and it stays there long enough, and I might be paraphrasing a little from you here, but if it stays there long enough, if it leaves public discourse, the private knowledge can disappear. My question to you, is a country like North Korea, we don't really know for sure if the people still have that private knowledge or are they just so far away from preference falsification because they're just kind of, I don't want to say drink the Kool-Aid, that's a little unfair, but you see where I'm going with this? Yes, no, absolutely. North Korea is truly an extreme case because they don't even have access to the internet. To be precise, about between 100 and 200 people in Korea, trusted people who have access to the internet, but the vast majority of the population, 99.99% of the population, do not have access to the global internet. They are fed information and that's all they get. And they're able to read books and newspapers and watch TV shows only that the regime allows. It is going to be when Korea finally opens up, we will see, and and I hope that we can rush in and before North Koreans learn about what they've as so many things that they've unlearned over the past 50, 60 years, we will be able to measure and document exactly what they think, exactly what they know. But what happens in such societies is that people actually do forget what advantages can flow from a free society. They can stop, they can lose their ability to imagine what it would be like to have freedom. They can lose their their ability to imagine a society in which many decisions are made by individuals in a decentralized manner. The Egyptian case that we were talking about is not that ex- extreme because Egyptians did have access to the internet, or at least half of, half the society that was wealthy enough to have a, an internet connection. At least they had access to ideas coming from outside the world. So in Egypt, there was a very large constituency of people who knew what they were missing. They could compare Egypt with other societies, other Arab, wealthier Arab societies, non-Arab societies, the European countries across the, the Mediterranean, and see how life could be quite different and how people were 
happier living in societies that, that didn't impose as many restrictions as Egypt did. But North Korea is a particular case. We do have other societies where the what I call the unthinkable has become the unthought. I'll give you a quick example from India, where for centuries people lived under the caste system. It's not the caste system is illegal now, but it's not it's not completely dead. But until the 20th century, the caste system, which divides Indian society into hereditary groups, hereditary hierarchical uh, groups, uh, this divided Indian society into various groups that had quite different privileges. The key concept that distinguished between various Indian castes was this notion of uh, pollution. You had, uh, at the very bottom, you had untouchables who were considered, who were born into an untouchable uh, family. They were considered polluted and nobody could even get near them. Nobody could have uh, a meal with them because they would get polluted themselves and it was considered quite sinful to get oneself uh, polluted. The interesting thing is even the untouchables who were at the foot of this hierarchy, of the Indian hierarchy, and who lacked all the privileges of higher castes and who were, who could only serve as toilet cleaners and do and, and garbage collectors and do the various dirty jobs in society, even they believed in this concept of pollution and they recreated among themselves within the untouchable community this hierarchy based on pollution. So there were untouchables of various degrees of pollution. They could not get themselves, the untouchables could not imagine a world without this concept of, of pollution because they lived in a society where you could not challenge this concept that divided India into these hereditary hierarchical uh, uh, groups. They could not escape, they could not escape uh, this concept. So the very concept, the very ideology that was the source of their horrible oppression for generation after generation, they accepted that ideology and recreated it in their own lives. I wonder whether, to come back to your example of North Korea, I wonder whether we are going to see similar things when North Korea finally opens up. It is such a repressive society that today we cannot even send in scholars to test whether this is in fact happening. And this is common in very repressive societies. They won't let you explore, they won't let outsiders explore the sources of repression and their consequences. If you could take me back in time, that aha moment, perhaps it was when you came up with the phrase preference falsification, but can you paint the aha moment the trigger moment when this happened? I mean, beyond, look, I, obviously you were writing papers and then the book, but there was just a moment where it was probably perhaps you or in conversation with someone else before you even got to the writing, you had that light bulb went off up in the air and you said, oh my gosh, this is a direction. I'm going down this path. Like, can, can you paint that for me? Yes, it, it actually happened when I was a PhD student at Stanford studying economics, one of the fundamental theories that any economic students learns is the theory of revealed preference. And the theory of revealed preference says that we can't tell what people's preferences are because they're in their minds. But we can see the actions that they take. We can see that when they're given 
a choice between an apple and an orange and a banana, if they pick the banana, we can infer that they have revealed that they prefer a banana to the apple and the and the orange. Well, I sat there in course after course being exposed to this, and I felt very uncomfortable. I thought there was something quite odd about this because in the classrooms that I sat in, there were I knew that there were some students who disagreed with theories of that their professors, not necessarily this theory, but theories that their professors uh, put forth, but they didn't challenge them because they were interested in a recommendation letter from them. They felt that in some cases that other students might ridicule them. It wasn't exactly the motivations behind selecting one thing one option or another, or preferring one theory or another, accepting a theory or not accepting it, was somewhat more complicated. That was, I I recognized that, but I felt as a graduate student in economics at that time, I felt that there was nothing that I could do, and I did not see how I could challenge one of the basic or the fundamental building blocks of economic theory. So this stayed in the back of my mind, but as I was working on other subjects, I decided that after I graduated, after I got my PhD, that I would start working on an alternative conception of preferences and one that would distinguish between honestly revealed preferences and feign preferences, feign the process of expressing uh, or feigning preferences is what I ultimately called uh, a preference falsification. The very fact that I did not in those classrooms put up my hand and challenge the theory of revealed preference was itself an act of preference falsification. I felt uncomfortable in doing that, but I also in my own mind was, in my own mind, was be- I was beginning to lay the foundations for an alternative to the theory that I was hearing presented again and again. So it wasn't an aha moment that immediately sent me to the drawing board and a month later led to a new article. It took longer than uh, than that, but this was the process that brought me to the concept of preference falsification. You know, you mentioned Stanford, the econ department. I mean, I don't know the professors at the time. I'm sure there were probably some, some rock star econ professors, so to speak. And I would think that that also plays a role. You know, if you're if you're a student in a classroom and, you know, your professor is, my gosh, I'll just pick an, your, your professor is Eugene Fama or, or Richard Thaler or some, some huge name that's, you know, won a Nobel Prize. You know, you, Mr. Student out there in the audience, 19 years of age, who wants to raise their hand? Well, my advisor, Kenneth Arrow, who already had, when I was his advisor, he already had a Nobel uh, uh, Prize. After I graduated and I started working on preference falsification, he encouraged me to work on this. He saw that I was getting somewhere and that there was something fundamentally wrong with the concept of real preference. Now, he, at the same time, he argued there are contexts in which it, and I would agree with him, contexts in which the theory of revealed preference is useful to use, where the sorts of fears and trepidations that drive preference falsification are not present, and there are some of those, uh, many of those contexts, that it's useful. But to give credit where credit is due, he did uh, support it. Now, whether when I was a second year graduate student in the classroom, whether he would have supported my writing a dissertation on this subject, I don't know. 
but I do have to give him credit for being one of my early supporters when I started writing on preference falsification, and many economists were quite skeptical. I got to give you all the props for this interesting path that you've gone down, because as political as America has become, this constant debate on the cable channels, everybody seemingly in a state of psychosis, all sides, it's nice to just kind of sit down with someone like yourself, have a nice conversation where you kind of get under the hood and instead of being emotional about what's under the hood, we just kind of look at it for what it is, describe it, talk about it, learn from it, and not allow it to become something where our blood pressure goes up so high that we need to go see the doctor. Yes, yes. And that's unfortunately, that is what much of television has has become. And there are parts of academia where that's uh, the case, where debate exists. We said at the start of uh, our talk there many areas in, in academia, there are many areas that are not touched at all, and many debates that don't take place at all, precisely because there's a fear that if you allowed people to express themselves freely, they would end up in the sorts of situations, dire situations that you just described. That's very unfortunate. The book, Private Truths, Public Lies, The Social Consequences of Preference Falsification. Let's see if we can get some bump on the Amazon rank there. You're one of my authors that I've had on where this particular book is a little bit older book. But again, I reached out to you because I thought it was so timely today. It's just so timely. We're just living and breathing it. I appreciate you coming on and giving some wide perspective about how it fits into all of our lives. Thank you very much, Michael. I greatly enjoyed the conversation. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.